And we are back, investors, here, another chat with Ryan Williams. We have amazing news that I just, I want to kick this whole chat off with that news. But Ryan, do you, do you want to share the news with everybody? Yeah. Um, so guys, this is now conversation number four, right? This is the fourth one? Number four. Yeah, so this is our fourth conversation, fourth uh, week in a row of, of doing this. And it's been so much fun just to be able to hop on and have these candid conversations. And um, it seems like you guys in the audience have really been enjoying this too, hopefully. We've been getting a lot of good feedback on on these last few chats. And so Ari and I are making it official. We are going to, and we've kind of, we've kind of already committed to it. I think, you know, we've we've said openly, like, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do this every single week, but we're making it official, guys. We're actually going to start a whole separate channel, podcast, whatever you want to call it, for these candid conversations, for these for these ramblings that that we have. And we're going to call it the deep end because sometimes, as I'm sure you've gathered so far, we we tend to go off the deep end a little <laughs> bit in these uh, in these conversations. But it's good; it helps us think through these sometimes like really complex subjects. Um, and so I think it's kind of a necessary thing, but also it helps us go a little bit deeper into the world of investing. Hence, the deep end is going to be coming to you every single week from here on out. And we actually just launched the channel. Um, a couple days ago. So if you guys want to go subscribe to it, um, I'm sure Ari will put the uh, put the link in the description, maybe in the pin comment as well if he's feeling froggy. Cool. But um, you guys froggy, definitely go subs. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> definitely go subscribe to the new channel, The Deep End. Um, and starting next week, I believe we'll we'll post our, uh, the next conversation officially over on the new channel. So you don't want to miss that. Um, and thank you guys too for all the great feedback so far. This has been really fun. I'll kick it back over to Ari and uh, let him share his thoughts. But it's, it's been a really enjoyable experience so far. And we're looking forward to keeping it going. Yeah, I, there's not even that much I can add to that. But I, I just want to share that, you know, I, I thank you, Ryan, and I thank you. You've joined us now for four chats in a row. And you've shared a lot of amazing feedback for us and questions and just keeping this momentum going really for us, which prompted us to start the channel. And we're just excited really to be here for you. That's, that's why we both started and that's why we want to continue and, and get in the deep end with everybody in terms of real personalized stories of like what's going on in our worlds, which hopefully transpire into helpful insights and advice for all of you. So yeah, it will be down there, the link in the pinned comment and the description because I'm feeling froggy as Ryan shared. <laughs> Ryan, what's been going on, man, since last week? How have you been? What's new? Um, things have been going really good, man. It, um, you know, just sticking to the portfolios, just going right there. Man, <clears throat> it's been such a, I feel like this last year has been too good in in the market, in investing, in the portfolio. I mean, I'm sure it's the same for you right now. We're sitting at all-time highs um, I'm coming up on almost ninety thousand dollars in the portfolio. Like, if it keeps going, I'll be there by the end of the week, um, Let's go. which is so crazy because I feel like I just hit eighty thousand a couple months ago, maybe. So this this last ten k really flew by, and you know I've been thinking about it. I put a video out on the channel talking more about this. But on one hand, I feel really happy about that because it's obviously it's good to good to be making money. But on the other hand. I'm a little bit, I'm a, I, I'm a little bit concerned by it too because I feel like it's almost been too good, and it's been too easy. You know, I think I don't know what the S and P is up this last year, and I really want to go back to like this past November, not just 2024, but like the start of last November because that's really where, at least in my portfolio, a lot of this craziness kicked off. It just really started taking off, pretty much like November first, 2023 until now. Um, and so it's got me a little bit concerned because it, it feels like it's just come too fast, it's come too easy, and this is not a prediction in any way, shape, or form. But it, part of me would not be surprised if next year we we kind of see a little bit of a reversion, you know, kind of get back to homeostasis. It's been a little bit too hot lately, so I wouldn't be surprised if we see a little cooling off period coming up here pretty soon. I don't know exactly when, but it feels like if things are, are have come this easy, you know, it can't last. And it, it there's got to be a, some point where it turns around. I just don't know when. You know what I'm saying? So I've been thinking about that really this last week 
these last couple of weeks. But in the meantime, the portfolio is still going up. So I guess I can't really complain too much. No complaints with the portfolio going up, but I can, I can hear you on everything else you mentioned. I mean, I like to call it emotional investing. And I personally think we've, we've been experiencing a lot of this emotional investing really since the, the election results. And I think we had that massive spike and run up and a lot of excitement, you know, for some maybe dreadful days for other, like no matter what side of the, the aisle you fall on, that was an emotional day. And, and I think we're still experiencing the emotions. And I also think, you know, we don't yet really have clear cut guidance on like what, what the next six months to a year is going to look like in terms of new policies. And I think a lot of investors are trying to figure that out too. You know, when I, when I'm talking a lot of these wall street folks, that's what I'm hearing a lot of the times, you know, we, we don't hundred percent know, right. We hear the word tariff. Okay. But we don't know what that's going to look like. We hear hard stances on certain policies. We don't know what that's going to look like a hundred percent. And on top of that, you know, when there's emotional investing, I'm, I'm not scared of it, but, but I stray away from actually buying because I mean, who, who wants to buy on these, you know, days where we're on a run up, right? I never really buy on green days. And it's also scared me too. I, I just digested some data earlier today. Consumer spending is going up, which is a really good sign. But then of course, on the other, on the other hand, we had a report come in and, and inflation progress is slowing down, right? So it's, <laughs> again, though, meaning, as investors. Um, meaning like the, the rate of inflation, the, the rate at which it's decreasing is slowing down? Yeah, yeah. So there's data that's coming out now, right? Like I said, we had consumer spending that's showing that, that consumers are, are getting back to spending. They're, they're still strong. They're robust. And then on the other end, in the inflationary readings, we're having inflationary signs that, okay, maybe it's not going at the pace we were going before. Now, what's interesting always about economics is, is the good old Peter Lynch line, right? Like you could study economics for, for I think, like 11 minutes or whatever he said, and, sure. and you'd have wasted 10 minutes. So... It's really anyone's game, and it's like find your high quality stocks to invest into. Just keep out of process. But I, I kind of struggle with that notion because I I like economics. I like using our macros to just know where to look, right? And like I, I try to just piece together at least a near term picture for myself to be like, okay, if this certain sector may be hit because of let's say consumer spending, right? And knowing consumer spending is on its way back up. That's where like a play like Nike, right, may come in and be like, well, maybe Nike will get the tail end of this positive wind, right? So I try to look at that. But again, it, am I invested for the next week to two weeks to a month? No, I'm invested for, for decades. So does that even really matter at the end of the day? No. Yeah. And you know what, man? This is something I think about often, especially like when I think about some of these conversations that we have and talking to you, because I know you're you're you know, one of your key phrases or catchphrases is macros matter. And I think about that a lot, like to what extent do macros matter? And I think you just laid it out really well. In the short term, it can matter a lot. It can really, whatever's going on with inflation or interest rates, or maybe just geopolitical stuff can impact certain companies or sectors or even the market as a whole here in the short term. And so that can, the way that people think about those events translates to the price action for you know various securities based on that and then that's going to move the share price in whatever direction in the short term so i when thinking about it that's kind of the conclusion that i come to in thinking about your catchphrase macros matter it's that's that's the extent to which they matter they can they really can dictate these these proximal events really can dictate share price movements in the short term and you know maybe it's not going to make a difference 20 years from now what what the rate of inflation is today or how it's slowing down or speeding up today. But yeah, it, it can impact what's going to happen on a, on a weekly or a daily basis for sure. And, and can create good buying opportunities today. So it's not something I also kind of, like you said, you don't have to spend a whole lot of time with it, I guess, but I guess it's good to be in the loop at least, you know, and, and use that kind of look through that lens when, thinking about maybe why X stock is down or, or Y stock is going up. <clears throat> that, does that all make sense? Yeah, 100%. Look, I, I kind of looked at it like, first of all, I tried to create a new, you know, I don't know, slogan or, or <laughs> you know, verbiage for like, 
I'm not timing the market when I say macros matter. And I think a lot of people grab that from that line. Like, oh, he's trying to time the market. No, it's like I'm looking at the near term events, right? Things that, for example, Exxon Mobil or any of these oil behemoths, right? Like when there's geopolitical issues, especially in the Middle East, okay, those companies are heavily impacted. Supply and demand of oil is impacted. And we usually get volatility. Now, a guy like Warren Buffett, investor like Warren Buffett, he like never left a dollar on the table ever, not even like a cent. He was there for to take it all. <laughs> so I kind of think like that. And then I also think about every time I speak to, to anybody, to any business owner who, you know, is operating, whether it's enterprise level or even small business, they have their head on the swivel in terms of news and so I kind of think about it like as an investor, as a, as a part owner in the companies that I'm owning, like I, I kind of have an obligation to, to put that CEO hat on and ask myself the same questions the CEO would be asking himself. So, okay, geopolitical issues, election, um, I, you know, I don't know, whatever, whatever. Maybe there's a, you know, some hurricane that hits, right? How are these events that we can't predict going to impact this sector? And that the CEO, whoever is running the company, is going to look at that and they also, by the way, you could track their, their trades. They also are sometimes trading off of these events, right? You think about if there's a, a war, well, then you start to think about how long does the war go on? What does, what does the war, depending on where the war is, what, what does that impact? Logistics sometimes, oil and supply and demand, prices spike, who's the beneficiary, oil companies. So you can use that. Again, if you're investing for 20 years, it's not the biggest deal in the world if you're going to save, you know, two, three dollars on the share price. But I like what Warren Buffett shares, like never leave money on the table. Yeah. And when it go when it comes to timing the market, I think it's timing the market is very different than timing the purchase of individual companies. Like they're two different things in my mind. If you're just an ETF investor, buying SCHD and VU, or even if it's just VU or VT or VTI every week, then don't, yeah, don't time it. Um, usually the context, usually that context is around like, should I start, when should I start investing? Should I do it now when the market's already gone up 30% this year? Or should I wait for a pullback? Because people, especially like my friends, whenever I talk to them about investing and try and like twist their arm to get them to actually start, that's always the excuse that you get is like, oh, well, I think I'm just going to wait for, it's been, it's really gone up this year. So I think I'm going to wait for it to, to come back. And it's like, okay, that's when you don't time the market, <laughs> just get into it, you know, but it makes sense to, to think about a lot of these things when it comes to buying individual companies, which is totally different than timing the market. There's a good time and there's a bad time to buy certain companies like Costco right now. Ah, Probably probably wouldn't want to buy Costco personally at this price. I think there's a much better price to get to get it at. I'll give you actually another better example. Rollins, my great white whale. I always go back to this one. You know, there was a good time to buy Rollins. I don't know that now is a good time to buy Rollins. I hope that being patient um, will pay off and I'll I'll find myself in a with an opportunity to buy it at a better price, at a better valuation. Maybe not, but I think that timing is more important and it and it makes um makes more sense to do that when you're thinking about individual companies cuz they can go you know up and down sometimes with great volatility and um sometimes you just need to wait for that that right opportunity um and when you think about it too going back to like being the the CEO of your portfolio or the CEO of your life we'll just stick to CEO of your portfolio you know, think about these publicly traded companies. One of the things that we measure and consider when investing in them is is how efficiently are they investing their capital? Are they able to generate high returns on the capital that they're deploying back into growing the business? And that's the return on invested capital, right? And that's that's a pretty important metric that we can use to help gauge like if this company is going to continue growing and be better tomorrow than it is today. <clears throat> it's a pretty important metric for just gauging overall quality. And the higher that return on invested capital, the better. The better that they are at putting their money to work and growing the business with that. Um, but we do, as the CEOs of our portfolios, we do pretty much the same thing. You know, what else is 
<laughs> like investing your contributions besides like seeking a high return on invested capital. The whole point is to create the highest return on invested capital. And maybe that doesn't matter so much if you're just buying VU or SCHD. Sure, you could time it, but what's the sense? Like you get into those things to not have to think about it, to not have to worry about it. Investing in individual companies is a different story. And with that, for sure, I guess generally speaking, you do want to have the highest return on, return on invested capital. But timing is more important when you're dealing with those individual companies. You want to do things and allocate capital across your portfolio to whatever looks like the best deal at any given time to generate the highest return that you can possibly get across your entire portfolio. Total, total ranch, uh, ranch it. Total, that's like a, a rant and a tangent, by the way. <laughs> New word. Going to get a t-shirt made. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much my, my tangent for the morning. Does that all make sense? Look, I, I think, you know, in terms of looking at some of the greats as, as everybody always does and should, you know, th they actually don't do everything they say we all should be doing. And, and timing the market is one of them. I, you, you hear a lot of like Warren Buffett's a great example. The guy sits on, and, and I don't want to take Warren Buffett of today. Like the guy sitting on millions and millions of dollars of, of capital. I want to go back to Warren Buffett's like earlier days, like in his 30s. That was a different Warren Buffett when he didn't have all the capital and he still held out for certain opportunities. I think sometimes we often overlook the fact that Warren Buffett also had to start from somewhere too. And he didn't just throw money into the market, you know, this dollar cost averaging strategy into the S&P. Like there were times he was waiting strategically for a really good buy-in opportunity. And therefore, he held on to cash. And I feel like some of, some of you out there would say, what a terrible strategy. But if you were sitting across the table from Warren Buffett, would you say that? Because he would probably look at you and laugh. You know, he's like, okay. You know, maybe, again, if you're a passive investor, all the more power to you. Like, there's no reason to, to hold back dollar cost average. But individual stocks is a different animal. And I think that's also... You know, I want to go back for a moment here to even the investor profile, as, as I'm always talking about, because I just got called out, Ryan, and, and I'm going to pop the question over you in a second. I got called out because somebody had commented on one of my recent portfolio update videos, and they go, you know, and I love the comment, by the way. I wasn't, I wasn't taken back by it. Or it wasn't like a hateful comment. It was just like a direct, hey, you're not a dividend investor, and you should – you shouldn't use the word dividend in your title because this is really a growth portfolio. And, and then it got me think like, what really is a dividend investor? And we've, we've spoken about this, question. Ron. But like, yeah. <clears throat> I'm a young, I'm 30. I'm a young dividend investor. So therefore, it doesn't make sense for me to invest in high yield dividend stocks, in my opinion, right now because I don't need the dividend income right now. I'd rather reinvest as much capital as I can. I still want the safety and reliability of these stocks that they deliver. So what defines a dividend investor? And, and then I just made a video about it today. But, like, but I'm curious to know, like, directly speaking, Ryan, am I a dividend investor or not? Do I, do I change the, the, the series, right? Do I just make it portfolio update, not a dividend portfolio update? Am I misleading? Well, do you only... <clears throat> Just sticking to the individual companies, not talking about mutual funds or ETFs that you have. For your individual companies, do you primarily invest in dividend stocks or do you only invest in dividend stocks? Which that's a whole nother can of worms, which we can get to. What is a dividend stock? But but before we get to that, like what what's your answer to that? Are you primarily investing in dividend paying companies or where are you at? I have two small positions, smaller positions in non paying dividend stocks, too. Everything what else are, uh, pays a dividend. What are those ones? Amazon, because it was trading at a heck of a, a discount when I when I bought it, and I made a great return on it. So, you know, why would I miss out? And Tesla, which I bought way back when. I didn't buy enough. I wish I bought more, to be honest with you. But but I also, again, like what I invest into, I am a fan, right, of Tesla. Mm -hmm. I, if I if I had to buy a car right now, I don't own a car right now, but. If I had to buy a car new, I'd go. I'd buy a Tesla for sure. So it's like I'm going to buy what I what I support and what I would actually buy. But besides the fact, those are my only two non-paying dividend stocks. And my kind of 
my approach here, I mean, my strategy, a part of the criteria is that the stock must pay a dividend. So in my mind, I'm like, no, it, I'm a dividend investor, dividend growth investor, or just dividend investor for sure, just because I'm not investing in stocks that only yield a three plus percent dividend yield. I don't know if it's totally on par to say I'm not a dividend investor. Yeah, it, I mean, it's so hard to put ourselves and I'm, it's funny that I'm, I'm saying this as, as a diehard dividend investor. Okay. Like I'm putting myself in this box, but gosh, man, there's so many contradictions with this stuff too. We are just walking contradictions, but this stuff is complicated. Like it's on one hand, I define myself as that you do as well, but it's also hard to put ourselves in these boxes. Um, because we are like complex human beings, you know, we are multifaceted. There's so many different, uh, different sides of the coin here. And so it's hard to, hard to label ourselves with just these one, you know, dividend investor. But I would say that, yeah, you, I, I think, I totally think you're a dividend investor. There's a couple exceptions in there. And maybe that's like the key, the key here. It's like those couple of stocks, those are the exception in your portfolio and not, not the rule, and it doesn't seem like they're they're huge positions. Maybe you're just testing the waters with them, or you have a certain affinity for them, whatever. And that's not bad, by the way, um, at all. But yeah, I would I would say if you're a couple of things, if you if part of your criteria, ninety five percent of the time, is to invest in companies like the presence of a dividend is part of your criteria. Yield aside, dividend growth rate aside, like there's nuance within there. But if part of your criteria is the presence of a dividend, then I would say that you are a dividend investor because you you strictly seek out, primarily seek out dividend paying stocks, which I think any dividend paying stock, regardless of the yield or the growth rate can be considered a dividend stock. And a lot of people don't agree with that. Kind of like what you were touching on a moment ago, a lot of people think it has to have like a, an X percent yield for it to be considered a dividend stock. Oh, that's not a dividend stock. Apple's not a dividend stock. Microsoft, get out of here. <sighs> Visa, don't even, don't even, how dare you call that a dividend stock? But I think it's true, like by definition, they pay a dividend, so um, maybe the yield's not as high as you're liking, but you know, just when it comes to ice cream, there's tons of different flavors, Baskin Robbins, you know, 31 different flavors. So things can come in different different flavors too. Dividend stocks, is, I mean, can come in different flavors. Um, and so that's number one. Number two, when you think, when you think twenty years into the future, thirty years into the future, what's your what's your ultimate goal with this portfolio? You know, do you is your goal to someday live off of the passive income provided by your portfolio without having to sell shares? Are you someone who's gonna go into the, maybe just sell off some shares like the 4% rule? You know, how do you plan to, to utilize your investments in retirement? What does that look like for you? I know personally speaking, my ultimate goal is to not have to sell my shares, just continue to hold on to them and collect that dividend income. And I think that's also another aspect of being a dividend investor. If that's your ultimate goal with the portfolio, well, the only way that you can really do that and accomplish that is by primarily investing in dividend stocks. Having a couple here and there that don't pay a dividend is not going to completely uproot that plan. Um, and so I think if it's those two things. If you are primarily investing in dividend paying stocks and if your goal down the road is to live off that dividend income and use that to pay your bills, then how could you not be a dividend investor? I think it's a good point. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm investing in dividend growth stocks right now for a reason. Ultimately, you know, everything comes down to total return. But over time, I mean, what's the most reliable paying dividend stocks are the companies that at the present day have a lower yield that can continue to grow the dividend over time to ultimately make more money. And that's what, I, you know, I could see if I was in my 40s or, or uh, 50s, you know, going more towards the... the you know, I don't know, British American tobaccos or Altria's, you know, realty income. But as a younger investor here with, with quite a few decades to go, I have room to sit in some of this growth for a growing dividend over time. And I think that's key. And, and again, 
the whole strategy, my whole strategy is there's a requirement. Unless there is an amazing opportunity, like there was with Amazon, or a stock that I was head over heels with, Tesla, that doesn't pay a dividend, I'll, you know, then, then I'll have to really look at it and I'll get invested. But if it doesn't pay a dividend, I don't even look at non-paying dividend stocks. Yeah. And I, I think this style of investing, you know, this is so interesting. Really interesting to think about. You know, I, 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 I associate dividend investing with – or investing in dividend-paying stocks with like investing in high-quality stocks because I think oftentimes the two really go hand in hand. Now, there's some not great dividend stocks, don't get me wrong, but like generally speaking, a company that pays a dividend is is more financially stable, it's profitable, can, it's the only way it can pay a dividend, it's generating free cash flow. You know, these are all things that you'd want to look for in a business, regardless of if it pays a dividend or not. And so I kind of, I, I kind of think in a sense, the two go hand in hand. And I think that's different the goal with those is different than investing in uh, – certainly different than investing in something like a GameStop or an AMC. Totally different type of investing, I would say. Um, depending on who you ask, they wouldn't even call that investing. It would be more speculating or there's a G word that people like to use. I don't want to get it, even get into that. But that's totally different than um, – the goal with that is totally different than what we're doing here. We're not – those people are trying to get rich by Tuesday, and I, I sure hope they do. I, I really do. We're after something different here. Um, we're okay with uh, we're okay with that different approach. If it takes more time, that's fine. Um, that's you know we expect it to as it should. And so I think that I don't know. I don't. I don't really don't even know what my point in saying all of this is. But I guess that there is just a different. How do I say it? There's there that's just a different goal, I guess, is what I'm what ultimately what I'm trying to get to. And I'm kind of losing myself, but well, look, at the, at the end of the day, it's also like we always talk about this. What are you investing for? And and like you yeah, already mentioned yeah. earlier on, it's like you're ultimately just gunning for the best ROI you could possibly get and the safest means that you know how to make it or achieve it. And so that's where I really come in and I say one of the prereqs that I have in a, in a stock is actually that it pays a dividend because that dividend shows me no matter how, how big the yield is or you know, how low it is, it's going to show me how reliable a company is contingent upon how long they can pay that dividend out, their payout ratio. Right? If you can pay out a dividend and you're doing that for a substantial amount of time, you're showing me that you have cash flow, enough cash flow to then reward your shareholders. And and also on the same you know in that same framework, if you take like a Coca Cola, I was just talking to to somebody about Coca Cola. It's it's still a great you know stock, a great company. They're not going to come out. Or I don't think they are. They're not going to come out with like a microchip. You know, like <laughs> okay. I, I don't have to worry about Coca Cola changing into some other drink made I don't know by AI or whatever. That might be that might actually happen, but. You know, whatever it is, Coca-Cola is going to be Coca-Cola, and we're probably all going to be enjoying Coca-Cola's 100 plus brands, you know, of, of soft drinks. So this is just a, a very reliable company with a great product, and that's what I try to look for. You know, exactly as I started investing, great, great company, great product, cash flow, a product that that's addicting or that people enjoy consuming, right? Even Apple products, right? You're you're in love, really, with the brand. You're loyal. That's what I look for. You know, so it's, I don't really care about the dividend yield. I care about the investment. Now, does the company pay a dividend? Yes. Do I only look for dividend-paying stocks? Yes. I, I would say that's enough to qualify me as a dividend investor. But, you know, when I read the comment, I was like, it's, it's kind of interesting. And I, I thought it was, you know, video worthy to make a video about it and like present my, my case. It's also interesting to see what's coming in now and the comments on that video because some of them are like, oh, you're a hybrid. I'm like, oh, that's called a dividend growth investor, right? Like, so it's interesting. And the, and the comment said originally, you know, I, I understand that putting dividend in the title, it helps with the algorithm. And, and I was like, 
I don't know about that, my friend. You know, like uh, probably I, honestly, I it probably it probably hurts you to be honest. We're with you. such a smaller community. Like if I just actually when I run the the SEO software, I actually get less viewership posting anything dividend related than I would generally speaking not using the word dividend. So I was like, it's just funny how that even works its way in. Like I'm trying to fool him, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, again, like I. The, the comment wasn't even meant, it wasn't like a hateful comment, but it was just like an, an inquiry really here and, and someone, you know, shedding light onto that. But I, I thought it was interesting. I, it was almost the highlight of my week, I have to say. Yeah, it's a really interesting thought. And I, I, I think this would be interesting to hear about in the comments too from you guys. I mean, what do you think about all of this? What constitutes a dividend investor and what constitutes a dividend stock? And is it okay to play outside of, you know, outside of that sandbox every once in a while? It's kind of like, here we go, I'm about to compare it to working out. It's kind of like, um, you know, I've been, I, I, I would primarily consider myself a weightlifter. That's pretty much my bread and butter. But I just started running recently within the last few weeks, you know, like we talked about last week. So, I mean, am I not a weightlifter anymore? I mean, I still be do careful, it. Be careful, man, right? you might like, be a jogger. <laughs> I might be a jogger now. I might, I'm, I don't know. And so I think it's kind of similar too. It's you can, you can wear more than one hat. And I think you said it best a moment ago too. It's like kind of when, yeah, like you're investing, investing in dividend pink stocks, but you're also going for ones that will continue to grow over time. You're a dividend growth investor, which kind of is, I guess in a sense, a hybrid approach, right? Like it's tying those two things, dividends and growth, which typically are seen as being, opposite ends of the spectrum are mutually exclusive. But that's not really the case. Like you can buy dividend paying stocks and, and see see great returns, like outperformance actually. Um, and so I, I don't know, I, I, I actually wrote about this just, just recently too on, in one of my newsletters. I think it's a mistake to think that those two, you can't have your cake and eat it too in that department. You can, you can collect dividend income while still seeing so, solid total returns, not just share price returns, not just dividend returns, but but both. And I'm thinking about like my portfolio. And before I even get to that, that can happen too, no matter what the dividend profile looks like. That can happen with low yielding stocks. That can happen with high yielding stocks. It can, it can happen with everything in between. And a couple concrete examples from my portfolio where I've seen this uh, these last couple of years really this last year too, like I said earlier, it's just been pumping. And these are gonna be different in terms of the, the dividend profile of these companies. Main Street Capital Corporation, high yielding stock, uh, consistent payer and grower, it's crushed it. My, my Main Street position has done really stinking well. Believe it or not, Altria Group as well, a very mature, very high yielding business has knocked it out of the park. It's been one of my best performers this last year. Um, Enterprise Products Partners as well, another high yielder, a dividend aristocrat, okay? And then on the other end of that spectrum, Lowe's, low yielding stock, high dividend growth, Snap-on, same thing, it's crushed it. Um, William sonoma <laughs> my goodness gracious, like the list kind of goes on and on. So I, long story short, I think it's a mistake to think that these two things are mutually exclusive. And we dividend investors, or we who, Maybe I need to change the verbiage now after this conversation. We who invest in dividend paying stocks are often on the receiving end of a lot of criticism because people say, you can go into to a lot of the comment section, the comment section in a lot of Ari's in my videos, um, and pretty soon on in the comments on the Deep Ends channel. Once again, guys, go subscribe if you haven't done so already. You'll be able to go into those, the comment section and see those people leaving those type of remarks. You'll, you know, dividend investing is for old people, dividend investing, you're basically always going to underperform, dividend investing is way too slow, you're never going to beat, the, why would you invest in dividend paying stocks, just invest in the S&P, it's way better, it's always going to win, and it's like, that's not necessarily the case, it's so easy to, it's so easy to assign these either or scenarios, or it's got to be this, or it's got to be that. You have to build, you're either building wealth or you're preserving wealth. You know, you're either growing or you're protecting. You know, guys, you can do both at the same time. 
you know, it's uh, you can you can really have your cake and eat it too. It's not easy, and it depends on a lot of different factors. But it's possible to to really build a solid all weather portfolio that delivers solid upside when the market's good, and also is protective and doesn't lose as much money as as other stocks might when things are heading south. And ultimately, when you zoom out across a long period of time, if you can balance those two things, <laughs> you'll find yourself with a portfolio that, that that outperforms in a pretty big way. And that's that's one thing that I think a lot of people forget about. You know, I, I thought the tangent was over earlier, or the rangent earlier, but I guess we're on to another <laughs> one. So I'm so sorry, man. I'm totally hogging the floor here too. But No, you're on a roll. You're on a roll. Look, and I it reminds get your... me. Ahead, it, yeah. it, it reminds me as you're speaking because it – you know what I was thinking about right off the bat when you said dividend investors get a lot of heat, a lot of hate. It's so true. And you know, oh, it's for old people, right? And at the end of the video that I made today of this, I tried to make it like a court case. In my head it was like working out. It was like I'm going to put, you know, the research on the stand, you know, whatever whatever. Yeah. So <laughs> this is what That's happens good. when you're when you're a solo YouTuber, no one works with you. You're just in your head all day like, I think this sounds good, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, I, I was thinking about just how much hate like a dividend investor would receive. And then, and then I go, you know, what's funny, even as I'm, you know, writing down these ideas, it doesn't even matter. Like, whatever's in front of the name or the word investor doesn't matter. You're, I'm an investor. We all have the same goal. And I actually brought quite a few differing opinions onto masters of the market. I had a few day traders come on. I had a few just ETF investors come on. I had, you know, uh, growth in tech investors on and hedge fund managers. And sometimes when I read in the comments, I'm like, it's, I hate to say it, but I'm, I'm just going to be direct. I see some pretty ignorant stuff in the comments. Like as an investor, speaking with any investor, whether they're trading and then they're seeing success from that. I always go at everything with the framework of, I have something to learn here. Like I can learn something. And I think we spoke about this before, but like since starting Masters of the Market and being able to connect to just a wide array of investors, yeah, for sure my opinion has changed on a lot of things because it makes you really second guess your strategies when you're stuck in your your way with your tunnel vision. This is the only way and it can only be dividend stocks. And then I, you know, when you interview enough people <laughs> and you're constantly talking to investors who have seen success from, you know, growth stocks and tech stocks and, you know, and uh, trading, it, it opens a few doors for you. Not that you venture down them, but you can at least open up the door and say, hey, I wonder how he or she did this. I wonder if I, if I will enjoy it. And I think that's important because even on this journey, if someone is to switch from, you know, a dividend investor to a growth stock investor, you know, solely growth, no dividends, I would be the first one to applaud them, to wish them well. Because we're all at the end of the day, again, we're on a financial journey together. I want to see everybody win. And so who cares? Like, what's it worth belittling? someone's title what they what they define themselves as you know like mm. it doesn't matter it doesn't matter that's 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 it right there what what does it matter it doesn't you know like um like you said man there's 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 so many different ways to do this and it it's it it's good for you to to have these conversations with these different people because it, it allows you to have an open mind and it just reinforces the idea, one that we've talked about numerous times, that there's more than one way to skin the cat. Like we're all after the same thing and there's more than one way to get there. And when we have these conversations and talk about different investing strategies and compare it to ours or how we do things, it's never from a like disparaging or a critical point of view. Um, all of these conversations, kind of the subtext there is is that understanding that Different things are going to work for different people. People are just wired differently, have different interests. Some people do really well with technical analysis, looking at the the charts and the candlesticks and whatnot. That's not really my cup of tea. It's just not something I'm interested in. But someone else is out there, and and they're doing pretty well with it. Now, does that mean I'm 
leaving money on the table or that mean I'm doing something wrong because I, I don't do those things. Not necessarily, you know, it's, it's good to recognize that there's, uh, that there is more than one way to do things. And that's kind of what I was talking about. It, we get, it's so easy for us to, to think that it's gotta be this or that, or it's either or, but it really doesn't have to be that way. There's so much nuance. <laughs> there's so much nuance to this stuff, um, which is both like the, what makes it complex, but also what makes it exciting to be able to, I guess, just turn over all these different stones and see what's under them. And and like you said, Ari, you don't have to use every piece of advice or or everything that you learn from talking to these people, but there's some of that stuff that you'll come away with and it will stick and you'll make that a part of your process moving forward and it will be a good addition to your tool belt. And I guess that's kind of what all it is, right? It's just continuing to refine your process and by learning more about what other people are doing, it just exposes you to more and you can you know, collect some of that and that will help you. You can take what helps you and, and leave what doesn't. And that's- uh, I just, I, I have such a cliche thought as you're saying this. I'm uh -huh. thinking about a toolbox and I'm <laughs> like, you know, typically we use like the hammers and the screwdrivers, right? But like, when's the last time someone used an Allen wrench? You know, but you have to have it, you know, like, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, you got to have all the tools. You got to know what you're doing, how to use the tools, when to use the tools. But primarily you have your, you know, your set core tools that you're going to pull out of that toolbox. And I, I just think that goes right off of what you're sharing. It's like, you, you really don't know when, where, how you're going to need to you, you know, pull all of your tools together and use them. And so don't yeah. reject ideas right off the bat, just because they're inconsistent with what you're thinking. Yeah, it's interesting to learn about how other people do things, you know, and it's uh, it's never like you talking to a day trader or you talking to someone who invests in just SoFi and Palantir or, or talking to someone who, you know, just does technical analysis or just trades options. It's it's probably interesting just to see what, what makes them tick and what, what draws them to that that type of thing. And uh, it's it's always interesting to compare and contrast, but yeah, Look, it's never I, any, I, never any. Um, I don't know. I guess you never just you never want to. It's never judgmental, it, and it never should be. So it doesn't have it if doesn't I impact you. I was talking in any to way. an investor, like not a dividend investor, and they were like, "I just made X percentage, you know, off of all these stocks. You know, I'm up all you know, all my stocks, all my holdings." The question I have is, what are you doing? Because at the end of the day, it's this total return game. Now I don't I don't really care what their what their strategy is. I want to know what they're doing and if it will if I can apply it. If I feel comfortable even applying it. Maybe it will change my opinion. Now, of course there's some people who like you talk to Palantir. You sometimes I feel like a lot of Palantir investors are like, Oh yeah, Palantir, just throw like ten K in there and hope it goes up. Like shoot for the moon. Let's go. <laughs> I'm not gonna listen to an investor with that type of, you know, strategy or lack thereof a real strategy. But someone who is actively involved just as much as I am in, in picking dividend stocks, but yet maybe it's a trader. I, I had a, a really successful day trader on Masters of the Market. The reason I brought him on is because he actually started with dividend investing and ETF investing. And then he found, he discovered trading and he really fell in love with it. So much so he quit his job and he went from debt to millionaire. I think that's a mm -hmm. cool story. Yeah, you know, and and it actually got less viewership for obvious reasons. As, you know, we're here in a dividend community, but I still took away in that hour conversation I had with him. I still took away a lot of insights about the market and investing as a whole, even though he had a different strategy. So don't be so quick to discount other investors and write them off like they don't know anything because your strategy is the best. And I see that happen so often. Yeah, totally, man. And it, it part of it too depends on what's going on in the market. You know, we've been pretty fortunate, like I said, this last year, where it's just been pumping, and it it can it can it can make you forget about the bad times, and it can make you a bit overconfident. Um, and during times like this is where typically where you see a lot of the hate for specifically dividend investors, but. There will come a time like where things won't be so good. And I think for a lot of us, probably some of some of us here in 
dividend investing community too, or who invest in individual stocks. It'll make us question our approach and whether it ultimately is the right one for us. And how I know that it is, like for me personally, how I know that this is a great fit for me and I, I wouldn't want to generally do it in a different way than I'm doing it is if I can persevere through the bad times. If I still feel good about what I'm doing through the bad times and if I if I can go into a year like 2022 where it, it was just a lot of red that year and still feel confident in the companies that I own and, and the direction that the portfolio is going, even though the share price isn't going up that that day or that week or that month or that year, sometimes even a couple of years. Um, if you can make it through those, those down times without um, freaking out and without, you know, feeling – feeling like you're you're doing something wrong, I guess, completely wrong, then I think that's a good sign. I think that's a good sign that you've found a good fit for what you're doing. So construction of the portfolio. Mm. I mean mm -hmm. look, I just this this comment came in on our last on our last chat and and I think it's a great question. Uh comment reads, another great watch, keep it up, gents. So we nice. certainly are. Uh quick question for you guys. How do you build the portfolio as far as far as investment allocation goes? I'm pretty new to investing under one year. I've done my due diligence as far as what I'd like to invest in at this moment. I've allocated my investment budget per month and have it auto buying on a weekly basis. My real question, we're getting real, I, <laughs> I guess is, is it better to split up that weekly buy towards all my holdings or pick some focus buys, build those positions up and move to the next few holdings in the future? Why don't you kick this one off, man? What do you think about that? That's a really, really good question. That's like a, for a new investor under one year, that's well thought out. So yeah, absolutely. I got to say already your, your mindset is on par with where it should be capital allocation. What is the best way to allocate my capital to generate the highest return on that invested capital? You're thinking like the CEO of your portfolio. If I had to, you know, I would say that from my experience, and this, this is the only way I know how to answer this one, from my experience, I think it's best to go down the route of being very selective with what you permit into your portfolio high, high conviction stocks. And when it's time to buy, buy. And that means, you know, don't, there's no reason to overload the boat with so many holdings that, you know, you need to sprinkle in capital over here when it should be here. Because your one position that you load up on, it could be like your home run gram slam stock, you know, it's like, that's the stock for me. Like, that was Apple for me over the years, and, and that's obviously my greatest performing position. Never failed me once. You know, Google fell, I think it was a year and something change ago, whatever, below 100. And I said, let's go. And I loaded up on that one. These have been my top performing stocks. Now, if I had the same strategy that I had back in 2020, where it's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have 30 to 40 holdings, and I'm going to try to buy each week all of these holdings... I wouldn't be where I am today, north of $231,000. So I say focus. Focus, don't jump the gun. Don't think you're missing out just because you're not sprinkling you know, the, the other holdings in your portfolio. Because perhaps those other holdings aren't even at a, at a right buy-in price. But what do you think, Ryan? I, I, I was, the only thing I was going to add to that was exactly what you said there at the end. Part of it dep depends on the valuation. I think if they're all at like an attractive valuation – it'd be hard not to take advantage of all of those at the same time. But I still think it goes back to focus and conviction. Out of those, let's say that there's three stocks this individual is considering, you know, and that's those are the stocks in question. Out of those three, there's got to be one that you feel like is a higher conviction, right? There's got to be one that you feel is, is, that you feel better about than the other two. And I think it would make sense to put more emphasis into that one. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean don't buy the other two if they're at an attractive valuation. Because I think if you still like them, think they're going to be good investments, then it's going to be worth building up those positions. But 
I think it's also okay to maybe go a little bit heavier into one and then put a little, save a little bit for the other two here. Um, I think it depends ultimately on those two things, where your conviction is and the valuation. And those are, that, that's pretty much exactly what you touched on, Ari. I really can't add much more to it than that. You were spot on. I, I also think, yeah, as I, as I think about this, it, it actually comes down too to how much money you're even investing. Like how, like I, I know it reads here that you're investing every week, which is great. It's automated, which is awesome. Um, but are you only investing $200 a week? Like, how, like what, what really, I can see, you know, if you're investing $10,000 every week and you can really load up on like handfuls of shares, but yeah. oftentimes, I don't know about anybody else out there, but I'm not a mega millionaire right now. So I can't you know, buy all the stocks in my portfolio all at one time and have that consistency in that strategy, I do have to be selective. And that's also why I decided to trim my portfolio down to be more selective and feed my high conviction stocks rather than just, you know, fumble around with some stocks that I'm like not so keen on or not so sure about. Why, why water them? Yeah, that's, that's, <sighs> that's so great. Sometimes less is more, right? When it comes to holdings, and less positions equals more focus. More focus equals less, uh, you know, a less difficult time making these capital allocation decisions. So it's tough. It's tough to say definitively, but probably more so lean toward focus versus spread out. Right. I got a good one for you here. Okay. Starbucks or Chipotle? <sighs> Gosh. That's a comment from our last chat. <laughs> it also says I buy five dollars of Starbucks stock every time I'm thinking of Starbucks, which is awesome. But <laughs> Starbucks or Chipotle? <laughs> oh man! Truth be told, I I f spend more money at Chipotle than I do at Starbucks, which might surprise people. Um, <laughs> but I love me a kind of hungry just thinking about it. Love me a double wrap burrito, chicken, extra white rice, black beans, double cheese, and walk. Put some. Uh, actually, I'm not a guac guy. Believe, don't. Ooh. I know. I know, guys. I know. Um, I get it from my wife. We got to start questioning else. if you're a dividend investor as well, man. <laughs> I know. But you know what's funny? So Chipotle is, is one of the few stocks that I think about. It doesn't pay a dividend, but it's one of those few companies that I love so much that I, I'm like, should I still just own it? I still, I just love it so much. I, I want to be an owner. But, you know, I, I, I'm taking that hard stance. Um and so because of that, you know, I, I got to give it up to Starbucks. But I think Chipotle is a, is a great business. And they've really tapped into something that has started to become widespread. Like prior to, excuse me, I mean, I guess Subway had this where you could build your own sandwich, right? But I think Chipotle really revitalized the idea of this customization thing. And maybe even Starbucks kind of was doing it too with their drinks, but maybe they lean more into it after Chipotle. But man, Chipotle, Chipotle does it right. It's great food, uh, you know, high quality ingredients. You can build it the way that you want to, and it's not, it's a really good bang for your buck. The thing about Chipotle is when my wife and I are thinking about going out to eat, we'll think, okay, where do we want to go? Do we want to go to Juan Slam and Fajitas? Do we want to go to Red Robin? Love Red Robin. Do we I want heard to that go- that name in a while. Oh man, it's so freaking good. Do we want to go to uh, you know, somewhere down on the strip? <sighs> or, you know, where do we want to go? There's so many different places. Nine times out of ten, we, we we go to Chipotle. You know, there's this really good Mexican place, kind of like a hole in the wall place by our house that we've been wanting to try. But we just we can't we just can't do it for some reason, can't pull the trigger. We always end up just going to Chipotle. For some of the reasons I just, all the reasons I just explained, like great food, we love it, um, and it's it's gonna be typically it's gonna be more affordable and and more filling, probably better than a lot of these other places that that we can try. So it's so hard to beat Chipotle, it really is. What do you think about that? That's that's such a tough one. <sighs> they're such different. Um, <sighs> you know, they're very much the it. same in terms of strategy, but they're such different. You know, products. You know, it's interesting. I mean, now now Starbucks really is going to be, I think, gaining some traction with Brian Nicole having joined the team, and he's literally coming from Chipotle. 
which I think some real magic could, could come about from that. It already is. Um, but, I don't, you know, start, the simplicity of Starbucks is what attracts me. You can't, you can't mess up coffee. You know, like you can't ever mess up morning coffee. Well, and, and some, they, some people think you can. <laughs> that is true. That is true. You say, look, I, I think that Starbucks has a leg up just for the simplicity of – and that's – by the way, I think Starbucks stock actually fell and the company did worse off because they strayed away from the simplicity of their product. Don't stray – like you, you are doing one thing and one thing only. You are known for making – I want to say like the white girl's coffee, right? But like, I, hey, I love some of those very sugary drinks even though I make fun of it. Um, what what was it? The pumpkin spice, must pumpkin be spice latte. Nice latte. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but look, this is they have hits, and and also same thing with Chipotle. I'm more of a instead of a burrito, I like to get the salad bowls. Those mm. those always had me with with some guac. But I think you know if I had to, wow, it's really it's that's a tough one. It's a totally different pro- type of product. You know, coffee's it's an addictive product. Caffeine, um, it's a bit more habitual. You know, people who go to Starbucks, a lot and of them affordable. make it a par- <sighs> Yeah, it depends to who you are. I mean, to, <laughs> to some extent. I mean, depends what you get for sure. I mean, that's one of the, the qualms for some people with Starbucks is that it's too expensive. But it also doesn't – historically, it's – that's been by design. It hasn't really tried to cater to someone looking for a deal. Only in these last couple or few years – couple years really under – um the previous CEO, Luxman, did they do more in terms of uh, discounts and deals? But the issue there is that it, it dilutes the brand. If you're trying to be a premium brand, then offering deals and discounts is really like a Band-Aid for a bullet wound. You're just diluting your brand, which may drive sales in the short term, but it's going to make it difficult in the long term um, because people are going to get used to paying those lower prices and, and ultimately you don't want them doing that that's not what you want to be known for so starbucks is i mean i think it'll be fine to be honest it'll be it'll be great but and it already is great but it's been going through a tough time it seems it does seem like it it had kind of lost its way and it was trying to figure out a, a few different things like the app the mobile app was really good to it good for it but that created certain bottlenecks to where people wanted more customization they wanted it faster and it was hard to juggle all of, all of those things like fast service, customer connection with the barista, which is huge. And that's one thing that Dutch Bros is really getting right. Um, so convenience, connection, and customization. Because if you're customizing, that's going to take longer. So then you lose out on the convenience and the speed. And also just drive through mobile app order. You lose that connection with the barista as well. So it was tough. It's tough to do all of those things. And I think that's what Brian Nickel is trying to come in and correct. He wants to get it back to its roots of being the community coffee house. And that means just kind of slowing things down a little bit. They've even put caps on the on the mobile app to where there are certain times where you just can't order it because it's it's going to it's just going to make the experience bad. Your coffee's probably not going to be ready in time and and stuff like that. So I'm 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 really interested to see how this strategy plays out. I think it's a good move. I think it is a reversion back to Howard Schultz's whole idea of being a third place. And that's really what made Starbucks so special. It was this gathering place where you could come together over coffee and community. The people knew your name when you went there. And one cool thing, sorry to go off on another tangent. One cool thing that I like about Starbucks is they're bringing back is if you go there, and I don't know how soon they're implementing this, but if you go there and you're you're getting a coffee to stay, they'll put it in like a ceramic mug like this instead of a to-go cup. So I think that's and and I think that's a really cool thing that they're bringing back. It's such a simple thing too, you know. And and you can you can take it and when walk out the door. Or did you just take yours? <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I mean, if you get it to go, they'll give you a to-go cup. But if you're there, right? Like they'll to stay, they'll give you a, a nice ceramic mug like this that's more comfortable. And you can really like settle in and stay a while, so I think that's good. You're like, you're like walking out. They're like, "Hey, wait, <laughs> that's ours." <laughs> I'll be interested. Yeah, maybe that. I'm sure that will happen, but I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what these next couple of years look like. Looks like for Starbucks, and then 
you know, one issue that they have. Chipotle has this too, I suppose. But Starbucks, I mean, competition is competition risk is becoming an increasing issue for Starbucks. Dutch Bros, Tim Hortons, Dunkin' seem to, seems to be doing pretty good. Luckin in China. China's got a handful of local domestic coffee shops that are uh, really but taking you know, some market. You know what's important about these other coffee shops you're mentioning? I think this is key. They're all starting off as just coffee shops. They like the product is coffee. They want to serve a good coffee and a good experience. That's what Starbucks originally was. You know, a place you can go in the neighborhood, get a good experience, interface with a barista, maybe have your name spelled wrong. You make a little joke about it. You know, send it to mm. your friends. Like, haha, they called me Arnie instead of Ari. I don't know. You know, and and uh, this was a great marketing ploy on their behalf. All of it. It was it was strategic. It was beautifully done. Mm. But Dutch Bros. You know, I, I've been to Dutch Bros. Amazing service. Amazing all around. Simple. And so you think about what Brian's doing. He's bringing it back to the roots. And you got to ask yourself sometimes, like even when you're evaluating companies, and this is where management actually really comes in for me as I, as I look at these companies. Like JP Morgan is, is a good example. Jamie Dimon's getting up there. And I'm like, I'm curious to know, like, who, like who's going to run JP next? You know, like, who's in the running? Berkshire Hathaway, we, we know who's in the running, but how is he going to interface with us? Is, is the Berkshire, you know, kind of brand? And, like, what, what happens to shareholder meetings? I mean, let's be honest, all, everybody only went because of Buffett, you know? So I think sometimes you get away from what something was really created for or rallied around for, and you totally lose yourself thinking that it's about this share price. I mean, it happened to Microsoft after Bill Gates stepped down and we didn't see any growth for for a long while. Uh, and it's so important. Get back to the roots. Like, I, I think we just, and this is like in all facets of life even as I'm just thinking about this, but like, why did you get started? Continue to build and lay the perfect foundation and it, you don't really don't have to overthink a lot. You know, Starbucks doesn't, the moment they started to overthink and try out all these new things, like I, I know you have to experiment to some extent, but again, you can't mess up coffee too bad. I don't, yeah, hopefully not too bad. Um, you know, some, Starbucks is not some people's cup of tea, which is an interesting turn of phrase, but... <laughs> It's not. Some people, a lot of, this is kind of the interesting thing about Starbucks here in the investing space. A lot of the negative comments I get about Starbucks as an investment has to do with people's thoughts on their coffee. They don't like Starbucks as an investment because they don't like the coffee or they think, they think it's overpriced. I don't blame them for that. You know, a lot of us investors are very mindful of where our money goes. The general public is not, not so much that way. And so I think you you maybe are thinking about it. You need to put a different thinking cap on and, and look at it through a different lens. Um, but yeah, I don't. It, it is kind of hard to screw up coffee, but it's also it's also um, coffee's only part of the experience when it comes to to Starbucks. You know, the connection aspect of it is huge, and that's why Starbucks over the years has really bent over backwards to try and make a good work environment for its employees, for its partners. And that's when it comes to, that's why like Howard Schultz early on implemented things like healthcare and, and benefits and stock options and, you know, uh, basically paying for employees college or partners college if they wanted it to. You know, they really wanted to make it a good place to work because they knew how important that connection was or how important that connection is for creating repeat customers. For something like habitual, you want you want people to want to come back every day. Um, now, the addictive nature of the of the product that helps, but people aren't going to want to deal with rude or cold service, you know, every single day. So anyway, knowing how important that was, they really wanted to make it like a good work environment for the people who work there because it all stems from that. If they're if they feel good about their job, if they like going to work, if they feel that they're getting compensated fairly and they like the perks and that should come out in how they handle the customers and how they create the product. There should be more care and ownership that goes into 
fostering that that community environment and creating those products. And it kind of trickles down from there. Happy employees equals good customer experience equals happy customers equals repeat business. And you know, that's just a that's just a flywheel. And if the employees if the partners, excuse me, you know, if they just took advantage of a lot of those perks, I don't know what a lot of them do with their their stock options that they get. I'm sure a lot of a lot of them don't really care about it, but they should. If and if they did, I think they would take more ownership in what they were doing. If they really understood how cool that is that they that they get that. And I don't know what the specifics is. I don't remember or I don't know what the specifics are. I don't remember off the top of my head. But I think that would be um if everyone understood that, I think that would be a, a pretty big game changer in how they approached working there, you know. So, and that's been one of the things that's been tough for Starbucks is just the employees haven't been happy for whatever reason. Maybe sometimes that's like a a never like the goalposts keep moving for that their happiness. I don't really know, but I, I think that's a uh, you know it's 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 interesting. I mean unionization, yeah, it's been a, a huge problem for Starbucks and. I understand that the Starbucks's desire to crush the unionization of of their locations. At the same token, I feel like Starbucks has been there for their partners every step of the way. And I also, I, you know, I'm just someone who says like, hey, if you don't like how much you're getting paid or the work environment that you're in, you don't yell at someone, you know, that it needs to be changed. You leave. <laughs> like you can go, you can go somewhere else. You're not stuck at Starbucks or any of these other companies, I, I just see like, you know, I remember in the early or mid 2000s, you know, when, when some of um, when some of my buddies, younger brothers were getting jobs at Starbucks actually to help pay for college. And I was yeah. like, that's pretty cool. That's really yeah. cool. That's a nice perk. And uh, and he was he worked for a barista, at, you know, for like a year plus. And, and it actually helped finance a, a decent amount of his schooling. And I was impressed. And I said, "There's." And this was when the unionization wasn't that big of a topic. You know, it wasn't a big deal. They they did right by their partners. But I also think that's that's so key, right? Are these companies that we're investing into? I mean, again, if we're if we're acting as an owner of these companies, the CEOs at that executive table, like, how do we want to go about keeping our employees happy? And that's key. Yeah, and sometimes it's tough. Like in the case of Starbucks, and there's two sides to this for sure. I don't know exactly which one is right. But on the other, well, maybe part of it's part of the issue is entitlement. Maybe things are really good. Like maybe these partners just don't realize how good they have it. They go work at McDonald's and they do not get the same perks as what they do at Starbucks. You can go work at Dunkin', same thing. You don't get the same same um, same things that you get at Starbucks. They don't give you stock options, they don't um, give you benefits, they don't pay for your college tuition. And um, so I think sometimes it's easy to to lose sight of, of how good you have it. And that's probably a part of the problem for sure. Uh, and I don't really know how you fix that. I don't know, but I do remember going back to uh, go ahead. Sorry, Ari. I was gonna say in, in, in due time, I feel like I, I I just feel like you know, all politics aside, just generationally speaking, like we need a reset. You know, we need to be able to to talk it out. You know, and I I think that's so big. Like the reason why I even love jumping on here with you is because, you know, I trust that if I say something a little wonky, you'll you'll share something with me that will spin me back in the right direction. You know, and that that's what's needed. And I feel like if I, you know, had anybody else on. And they were just agreeing with me or didn't have any real perspective or thought, you know, it's, I mean, that wouldn't even be interesting to listen to. So I just feel like, like you said, this entitlement that we have, you know, not even knowing what you had, the opportunity that you have in front of you, guaranteed there are some partners at Starbucks or some of these other companies that allow you to, to take ownership there and pay you in shares or a share program. They probably have no idea what the power of those shares even do for them. And that's their responsibility, you know, but it's, oh, you know, it's a, I think it's a generational thing here. I, I don't know. I, I am worried about, you know, as a, as a younger guy, like I said, 30 years old, I, I do look around and, and my ears are always open, 
even just the way we talk to each other, you know, in the comments, it's like, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you definitely get a lot of entitlement in the comments. I've been, I put out a video. <laughs> I probably shouldn't even be saying this, but <laughs> <sighs> what are they going to do? I put out a video on Sunday and it was about an eight minute video. I think it was exactly like seven minutes and 50 seconds seven minutes, 52 seconds. And I had like a, an ad for snowball analytics in the video, which ran about two minutes long. And I, I got a couple comments from people who weren't happy that there was, that the video was only about eight minutes long and there was a two minute ad in there. So, and I just, I don't know. I look at those comments and I, I understand why they say that on one hand, I guess they feel like they're getting gypped or it's like they, maybe they feel like the whole, point of the video was just to, I don't know, have the sponsorship ad and everything else was just fluff. But at the same time, I think, you know, <laughs> if the worst part of your day is that you clicked on a free YouTube video and had to see an ad, which you can skip, by the way, if that's the worst part of your day, I... I think you're going to survive. I think you're going to be just fine. And I, I think about comments like that. And I can't help but think, you, man, you don't know. You just, it's so easy to forget how good you really have it. Mm. And you use Snowball Analytics. It's not even like Dude, you're, you're pitching I, them. You, you use them actively. <laughs> I will sing praises about Snowball Analytics from the mountaintop. I love it. It's a great platform. I'm happy to promote it. And I've only gotten good feedback from the people who've used it too. I think it's, I think it's a great service. I think it's a great product. And I think it, it's totally relevant to you know, what people who watch our videos are into. I think it's, it, and they've been great to work with too. So, but anyway, and you know, you can't make everyone happy at the end of the day for sure. And I understand why, why people, <laughs> I understand why, why I, those comments pop up from time to time. I, I totally do get it. But at the same time, it's like, come on, if, if, if those are the things that you're complaining about, you've got it pretty dang good. Not only that, it's like how many times in the last month when you have been producing videos, have you given two minutes to snowball analytics probably i'd bet maximum maybe five minutes you know, I, I don't know oh yeah but with each whatever it's been but they've gotten hours from you you know yeah and it's okay it's whatever it's not it's not a huge deal um it would be nice though if people just maybe thought a little bit before leaving comments like that because it's it's it just comes off totally <laughs> entitled and like very bratty in my opinion, it's, it's you know it's funny, and we often you know speak about this offline. But I feel like this is worthy of even letting community members in on this. It's just like we have decided to make YouTube and doing stock research and sharing insights and information. We have decided that this is going to be a full time job. And so when there's opportunity, I'm not even I'm not even afraid to say this. When there's opportunity, as long as it's the right thing, as long as I stand by the product to share it with others, I'm absolutely going to take the opportunity. I have never used a portfolio tracker before in my life. I had like my own I'm a simple simple guy. And I always watched your videos, Ryan, and you had a portfolio tracker, and I was like, that's so cool. One day, maybe I'll build that out, and I just never did, you know? And then I got approached by Snowball Analytics, and I got approached by Gitquin. They literally approached me in the same week. I just so happened to use Gitquin, and I really liked it. And I was like, wow, I know that over the last few years, I haven't been using a portfolio tracker. I wanted to, so let me give this a shot. I started using it. I didn't even air anything yet on my channel until I actually discovered that I liked it and that it was something that I thought was worthy enough to go on. And um, yeah, it's kind of like, that's how I look at that. It's like, it's just knowledge, you know, and you could skip it if you want. But at the end of the day, it's like, we are here taking on this full time, which is really hard. This <laughs> YouTube journey 
and and like solar solopreneurship, especially specific to YouTube, is not an easy business route. No, and at the end of the day, that's what we are doing. This it's we're small, independent businesses, right? And in any other case, like you'd want to support your local mom and pop hardware store, or grocery store. You'd want to support local, and that's kind of really all we are at the end of the day. And um just kind of bouncing off I think your overarching point here is like at the end of the day you know we will always try and do right by the people who watch our stuff and we will always try and I, I think I, I know I can speak for you when I say this we will always do our best to be a force for good in this community like an enthusiastic force for good an encouraging force for good in the investing space because you know, so many people are intimidated by this. So many people don't start because they they think it's so complex and they, they're afraid of doing something wrong. But like we will always do our best to try and do right by the people who watch our stuff. And, and um, like, I don't know, I'll say it again, just be a force for good and encouragement. And, um, you know, people might not always agree with our decisions or opinions and that's okay. Like that's that's what makes the world go round. But We'll always try and do the right thing and we won't ever, you know, push something that we don't actually think is useful or helpful. Um, and we won't, we won't ever, you know, talk about things that are clearly like scammy or not going to benefit you guys. Like that's why we don't really, <laughs> you probably won't hear either Ari or I talking about Walgreens as a good investment anytime soon. We could talk about like in talking about a video about three cheap stocks. We could very easily talk about something like Walgreens. In talking about high yield investments, we could, you know, three high yield stocks to buy. We could easily talk about A, G, and C. But it's like that wouldn't be that we would not be doing the right thing. I don't think by doing so. And the same is true when it comes to the things that we promote. And because um, at the end of the day, like for longevity, like you got to feel good about what you're doing. If you don't feel good about what you're doing, that's going to come across in everything else. And, um, so it's good. It, it's obviously you want to try and do the right thing. So. Look, it's, it's interesting that you even shared that because I even, in terms of investing, I stray, I know that, that British American tobacco and Altria are fantastic investments for dividend investors. But I personally, I don't want to stand behind a company that sells products that we know, you know, literally causes can't, I just can't do it. Now, interestingly enough, right, that you, you can, and then I thought about this a great deal. It's like, well, Coca-Cola is kind of there. You know, like the McDonald's of the world isn't a healthy investment either. You can look at a lot of these companies. But, I mean, very directly, some of these companies, you know, that are out there for us to invest into, I even look at it in that perspective. And I try to stray away. I think I've mentioned, like, British American Tobacco and Altria only a few times on the channel. But I just, I don't know. It's something, something for me doesn't check out, you know, with that type of, YouTube strategy even just pump out what I know will attract people to watch it. I, I want to pump out information that I think is is good for others to digest and consider whether that's, you know, what I'm using in terms of stock research or portfolio trackers or even the stocks. Like how I run my life is the same way. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense, man. When it comes to portfolio trackers, you know, I've I promote a handful of them at any given time. I got my my own portfolio tracker. I've got Snowball Analytics, Getquin, the Dividend Tracker. Um, and one might think, what which one should I use? Like, why would you talk about all those different ones? And it's like, well, you know, people have different tastes. People have different preferences. And I think, just going back to what I was saying, we're only going to talk about things that we actually enjoy and think could be of, of use. And I think that, like, depending on who you are, you'll like one of those. Someone might not be a spreadsheet person, so they might want to use GetQuinn or Snowball Analytics and vice versa. Um, people might like the interface between – or the interface on GetQuinn more than they do Snowball Analytics. So I think it's good to, to present those different options and, and let people choose for themselves You know, because there, there are a lot of great platforms out there. There really are. Couldn't agree more. There's probably more. I mean there's, there's more coming. I – Oh, yeah. You know, as a creator, you get emailed all the time about, you know, can you promote this? Can you promote that? And I even do the due diligence on some of these products before I even entertain the email. 
a lot of them I just flat out reject because I'm like, is it necessary? You know, like I, I, I don't know if everybody's noticed this, but I even am not so keen on, on even having Seeking Alpha or Tip Ranks or any of these companies for stock research on, you know, anymore like showcasing them only because for me personally, I don't use them on the day to day at at this point, like today I don't use them. So I'm like, if I just go on Google and I get the same information from Google, very simply laid out for me, do I need to go any deeper with some of these stock research sites? You know, I, I'm very conscious about that. Yeah. And that's not to say that someone won't, you know, other people are the opposite. They won't use Google. They'll, they'll, they will use Seeking Alpha. They'll look up financial statements there, whereas you might go directly to the investor relations page and pull up the 10K or the 10Q and do it that way. Everyone's got a, everyone's got a different process. That's, uh, I don't know, that's kind of the theme of this conversation, I feel like, in a lot of the ones we've had, just there being more than one way to skin the cat in terms of investing and also how you, you research your investments. But it's cool. Like, it, it's... Uh, it's such a it's such a great time to be an investor right now where we're so fortunate to have these different options. It's so crazy to get these and maybe not crazy but it's we get comments from time to time from people who've been investing for a long time which is really cool to be able to connect with those people who've like done this for so long. But it's so funny to hear some people say Man, I remember just 20 years ago, I remember back in the 90s or back in the 80s or back in the 70s, we had to go down to the library to get um, get the financial statements or get the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal or whatever it is. So it's, um, or, you know, just getting into, uh, you know, you had to pay eight bucks per trade or $25 per, per transaction. So it's, it's, it's a really good time to, to be an investor. We're very fortunate. This reminds me of what, you know, Nina just dropped on, on Masters of the Market, the most yeah. recent chat numbers with Nina and she you Great know, someone conversation, came from, by the way. Amazing. It was all her, man. All her. I mean, powerful story. Moves from you know, immigrates from Africa to the US, hundred and twenty thousand dollars plus in debt. And then ultimately in a few short years, she works her way up to over half a million. Mm. Wow. Talk about a powerhouse of a woman. Um, and by the way, she's going to be coming out with a YouTube channel as well. So everybody should stay tuned for that. Um, but what I wanted to share, what she really harped on was like, no excuses, no excuses. Cause she was like, I came from Africa. I immigrated here $120,000 in debt, you know, still went into the market. And right now today there's fractional shares and it's like, wow, like boom, 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 a KO man, just a knockout of like insight that was thrown your way in like 30 seconds when she was talking about no excuses. And I feel like just today, I, like I was sitting for dinner with someone and he was like, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know if I can, you know, really start to invest. How much money would you say is a good starting, you know, principle? I'm like, what do you mean? Like fractional shares, man. You know, like there's no excuses with this, the same conversation we've been having. I sent him Nina's, um, the interview with Nina, but <laughs> I was like, just watch this. You know, I don't have time for yeah. it anymore. Yeah, but that'll kick you it's, in the it's gear. real. Yeah, uh, it's like there's no excuses here. No excuses. Um, I think people just have to learn to stop spending elsewhere. Ryan, we'll wrap up, man. I want to ask you the last question. What, what do you, if you've bought anything on the week so far, would you buy and are you going to close the week out with any buys? Yeah, I was going to ask you the same thing, actually. Um, yeah, I, I picked up some more clear secure um, on Monday. So I think nice. I'm up to 82 shares or maybe 88 shares at this point. i um, going to get to 100 and then maybe maybe see where, where we go from there. Um, but yeah, just some more clear secure. Dollar cost averaged into VU and SCHD as I do every week. But that's about it, man. It's been... Um, pretty straightforward couple of months of buying that's pretty much been the mo so and, and i guess we'll be for at least the next couple of weeks but how about yourself what's what's going on in your portfolio man man i had a i had a big week last week i think i spent over three grand buying some, wow buying some stocks i bought you know multiple about a handful of shares worth of google oh. uh, i picked up another slice of vgt vanguard technology etf 
Vu. Um, that was all last week. And, and coming into this week, I mean, I, I don't. I think the market right now is it, it kind of shot back up from last week. And like I said, I only really buy on on red days or red weeks. Um, but with that said, no matter what, I also have the VOO DCA strategy. So no matter what, every week, if by the end of the week I did not buy anything, I must pull the trigger on VOO at least one share. Like that's my commitment to myself. Uh, but man, I'm sitting on a lot of cash right now, and I'm about to I'm about to even put more cash into the settlement fund. Wow. Um, but I'm I'm sitting on still like twenty I think over twenty six thousand nearly $27,000 worth of cash. Good for you, it's man. It's in there. It's in my settlement fund. I'm waiting around for something to happen. Still dollar cost averaging in, like I said, to VOO. But given my, my strategy, I mean, very focused and scaling like really seven positions, and, and none of them are, at, are really at an attractive price point for me. Mm. Just sitting, I think, this week. You know, VOO will be the, the buy-in at the end of the week probably. So when it's in the settlement fund, is that um, is that in like a money market fund, or is yeah. that just sitting in? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's generating some so, interest, even though it's just. Oh sitting. yeah, yeah. I, that's that's actually why I moved it there, because mm-hmm. I had you know basically I have like a pool system that I created for myself. So all my income comes into a Chase bank account, and then from the Chase bank account. The moment income is in there, I only ever have that account sit on five hundred dollars. This is just like a liquidity fund. Oh, and so I have five hundred dollars. It's always in there, no matter what. And then I have income streams that pour into JP this this Chase fund, this Chase bank account, and then immediately I shift funds into Capital One, which is a high yield savings account. But you just can't beat you know if you're not going to touch the money, you just can't beat throwing it into the settlement fund because the settlement fund, at least with Vanguard right now, invests primarily in, in like bonds. And actually, at the end of a month, I, I bring in like a fair amount in dividend income, you know, and, and, and just income through that settlement fund over a hundred dollars every oh, month. Wow, nice. And so when I look at that, I'm like, that's that's great, you know. Capital, considering Capital One, I'm getting like maybe five dollars, you know, if I just keep holding money. And don't get me wrong, I think I have, I think right now I have like another twenty five thousand dollars sitting in there. Um, so the money's there, but uh, you know I have another brokerage like the four hundred one ks. I have it all there, you know. But uh, it's it's just interesting. The the pool system I created for myself is what I always share with people to do because you really you're able to see what's coming in and then quickly kind of move it to where you need to go. And you need it, it requires some action on your end. I personally don't like automation because it for me and this is not for everybody, but for me it keeps me motivated to track my money to understand it. And then to act as the CEO of my life, mm. I would I would imagine that you know no one's automating their unless it comes to simple tasks, right? If you're just investing in VOO, fine. But for me personally, I'm I'm not you know necessarily just with one single fund. So uh, I like to to take action on it, and I like to even just taking a look like life planning. I always am looking at my next you know what do I want to do in the next thirty days, six months, one year, five years doesn't mean i'm gonna hit everything but i gotta have this strategy there so yeah That's awesome, that was man. a little tangent <laughs> um do you do you use any app or platform for just simple budgeting no do you no i i do i use an app called copilot which i really love i wish i wish i was an affiliate of theirs because i would definitely promote the heck out of it it's been a really good platform um it used to be called something else um Maybe it used to be Marcus or something like that. Marcus, yeah, Mint yeah, or, with Marcus. yeah, I think Mint that's as well. I don't know. It, it used to be, and I could be thinking of mistaking it. Marcus for else, was but... uh, was a high yield savings account, if I'm not mistaken, right? Or did they I turn that remember. into something else? I don't remember, and I could I could be totally mistaken, but I use that for all my budgeting, um, and it's really it's been a great platform. I, it's something that you pay for. Um, but I found it to be worthwhile. I think I've used it for almost a year now, and I really, really like the app. Um, and I, I need to be better about doing what you just described, like a sort of pool system. You know, I, I have my kind of similarly, all my income goes to like a business checking account, and from there, I need to be better about not keeping it in my checking account. 
Um, I do really good putting money into the portfolio, obviously. That's automated, both in my taxable and my Roth IRA. But I don't have a great system for transferring it to my high-yield savings account. I have a weird mindset around it. <laughs> it's, it's, a total, it's a total mental hurdle that I need to overcome. But I like I, f I feel comfortable having money in that checking account, knowing that it's there whenever I need it, super liquid. It's a, it can be used immediately. And for some reason, and I have an ally savings account too, high yield savings account, and I don't know why I just don't I don't put the majority of it in there, even just leave like a, a thousand or a couple thousand in my in my checking account. Um but it's it's kind of a it's just a weird mental thing that I really need to overcome. And I'm I'm leaving probably forty to fifty bucks of of interest income on the table f uh, every month just from keeping it in my checking account at this point. And so and, you know that's a few trips to Chipotle every month. So I need <laughs> there to you go. really be better about that. Or, or one for frappe mocha choca latte mocha -choca. from Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Your favorite drink. Just, just one of them, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, it's 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 interesting. That's that's a lot of people actually, you know, having that issue of like they want they want the liquidity, but it it, it for me, it, like I'm so focused on you know every purchase for myself. First of all, I'm so simple. You know, I don't like I don't buy a lot, man. I don't buy. I don't know if anybody out there has noticed, but every YouTube video, I'm wearing a black shirt or a black sweatshirt or a white shirt and a white shirt. Like I I my life is pretty black and white. Um, mm -hmm. but I like the simplicity and so therefore I don't buy a lot and I invest everything. And so when I think about just keeping money stored away in, in a, you know, checkings account, not bearing even anything for me in terms of interest, I mean, just like Warren Buffett, like never leave even a penny on the table. And maybe, I don't know where that stems from. I'm so comfortable with that idea. I would be uncomfortable to leave money in the checking account. Yeah, I know it's. It doesn't make sense because even a high yield savings account is is extremely liquid. Um, yeah, I you think just what it is the money though. Back. <laughs> yeah, I honestly can't tell you. I was about to come up with an excuse, but I don't even have one. So <laughs> maybe I'll figure that out. Like maybe I think that's probably what it is. I need to figure out how much I want to leave it because I still want to leave some in the checking. I would need to have more than 500 bucks in the checking account. I, I feel like I would need to have probably at least a couple thousand to still feel still feel good. Uh, it's a good starting point. Yeah. Like have have um, like maybe five grand in there. Yeah, that's that would be good. Maybe when, do that. when are you ever going to need to go to the ATM and pull out five grand? You know, no, like dude, on a, on I a never, I never have. I, it, and that's what it is. What if there's a big thing that happens to where I need that money today, right now, and it can't wait the two or three days that it would take to transfer from the savings to the checking? That's, I think that's what it is. That's the big mental hurdle. But I mean, to your point, that's never, that's never happened over probably a couple of years at least that I've been thinking about it. So that's been. That's been a lot of interest left on the table. So maybe, you know what I'm going to do, man? This is my commitment for the week. Ooh. And I'll do it. No, I won't do it now. I will do it today after we get off this call. I will transfer. I could probably transfer. Let me think here. You know, what I did is anything over a certain amount, I just transferred. I never even think. Okay. By the way, I didn't start with $500. I started actually with two thousand, and and that was like a comfortable number. And then like after six months, I was like, okay, this is just dumb. Like I, I also never gonna need, you know, two thousand. Mm -hmm. And so then I I went ahead to pull out. Or I'm not pull out. I went ahead to kind of limit myself in that account to a thousand. Okay. And then a year went by, and then I go, five hundred. <laughs> you know, and okay. It, it's just to the. And I also I'm a big credit card guy because I'm responsible. Another mm -hmm. thing that like I'll, I'll share. If you're using a credit card and you're responsible, I mean points, points, points. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I don't I don't ever use cash ever. Unless I really have I just actually bought a new suit the other day for myself and the tailor only accepted cash and I went to the ATM. This is how little I pull out cash. My ATM card didn't even work. Oh dang, like it expired. <laughs> it did, or it something. didn't even work. 
No, because it said you never used it before. Oh, so that's I, I funny. had to call the bank and say like, okay, I'm, I'm, at, it's me. I'm using it now, but it, it, I never used it for so long since opening it up. <laughs> it just stopped working. That's funny, fraudulent man. withdrawal, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, and I'm the same way. I pretty much just use my Southwest card for, you know, everything that I can because I pay it off at the end of every month and never spend a crazy amount either. Um, I could come up with a ton of bad excuses to why I still keep so much in the checking account. Just a mental roadblock, but this is the commitment. I'll transfer 10K into the high yield savings account. I think that would be a good compromise for now. I'll do that as soon as we get off the call, as soon as we get done here. So, That's a big commitment, man. You know, it could That's probably like get... overcoming some fears as well. Yeah. Watch by this Friday, something happens, you need five grand immediately. <laughs> Knock on yeah, wood knock, there. Knock on some wood. <laughs> but I'll be good. You know, I'd probably get an extra probably 40 to 50 bucks a month in interest just from doing that. So why not? Let's give it a shot. That'll still leave me yeah. some cushion in the checking too. So we're good. Look, I do it on both on both ends. I, I get anything over $500 in, in that Chase account immediately goes to Capital One. Anything over the $25,000 in the Capital One goes immediately to the settlement fund. And it just keeps trickling upwards to make me ultimately more money. But this, the high yield savings account is really like that safety cushion for me mm -hmm. because I know I can just send it back to Chase. Now, it will take a day, but mm -hmm. I can send it. Yeah, that's not bad. All right, I'm doing it. The cool thing, too, about so, allies, you can create like different buckets, you know, different categories basically. So in there, I've got a travel fund, I've got like a. You know, like a, a furniture fund for the house or something if we want to buy some furniture, whatever. Um, and this 10K will be like the emergency savings. So, which has been good. Yeah. I've been wanting to have something specifically set aside for that instead of just having X dollars spread out that I can pull from any time. It would feel good to have that compartmentalized a bit. The game is on. With that, I guess we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. But investors, throw down in the comments. I mean, questions for the next chat, and of course, it will be on a brand new channel, the Deep Dive channel. So yes. tune in every week. Make sure you're subscribed to that channel. Join us. Toss us questions now here in the comments for this video, so we can take it to the new channel. Ryan, you wanna you wanna end us on a high note? Yeah, I just want to thank you guys so much for tuning in with us once again. Episode number four. Almost an hour and 40 minutes long. These ones just keep getting longer and longer. But uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for, for spending this time with us, supporting us, and um, just being along for the ride. It's really cool to, to have you guys, and I hope you guys enjoy this ep enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you in the next one. See you in the deep dive. Exactly. <laughs>